Well, Valentine's Day is coming up, or as some might like to call it, Single Awareness Day. Uh, some people don't like Valentine's Day. I don't know if you're a person that doesn't like Valentine's Day or not. But contrary to popular opinion, Hallmark did not actually invent Valentine's Day. Uh, it's a shame kind of that Valentine's Day is such an underappreciated holiday. Uh, because St. Valentine, the guy who the holiday is named after, is actually a pretty remarkable man if you ever want to study up on him. But uh, one story I like is that he was a follower of, of Jesus. He was a priest himself. Uh, he was uh, lived during the time of Rome, the Roman Emperor Claudius, and Claudius was decided at one point to develop this edict to prevent young people from getting married. And because he liked for men to be unmarried so that he could draft them into the military, and he thought that they served better in his army when they weren't worried about their wives and children at home. So Valentine, though, would secretly marry young Christian couples until Claudius found out about it and then put him in prison and eventually executed him. But it's not normal for most people to think about those stories about Valentine on <laughs> Valentine's Day. Normally, instead, Valentine's Day creates different thoughts inside of our head. We normally uh, feel pressured during Valentine's Day to have our relationships to be just perfect. But normal relationships, we all know, right, are not perfect. It's not normal for relationships to be perfect. It's not normal to always have kind of the lovey-dovey Valentine's Day card kind of feelings about relationships all the time. Instead, it's normal for relationships to be broken, to be hurting for various reasons. It's normal for relationships to be selfish, honestly. So if your relationship isn't perfect this Valentine's Day, if it's broken, if it's hurting, if it's selfish, all that stuff is normal. But, as we're challenging with this series, but aren't you just a little bit tired of normal? And wouldn't it be better, wouldn't you rather have your relationships be better? To be a little bit better than normal, to be above average, to even be thriving. And so Jesus, I believe, wants our relationships to be like that, to be thriving relationships, to be better than normal, to be abnormal. So the, the teaching of Jesus on relationships is actually very abnormal. It's so countercultural. It's so counterintuitive. You would never think of this stuff all on your own. Jesus' teaching on relationships stands out as, as really weird among other moral teachers and philosophers. It's the kind of teaching, I think, that is so out there, that is so otherworldly, that you might almost think that it must come from someone from another world. It shows us, I believe, that Jesus is the real deal. He is who he says he is. And if you start putting this teaching about, uh, about relationships that Jesus gives us into practice, your relationships will actually become the real deal as well. Your relationships will stop being normal, and they will actually start thriving, unlike the rest <laughs> of the relationships that you see in our society. And see, the crazy thing about this teaching of Jesus that is, that is so abnormal and that is so different is that it's also so simple. It's a very simple teaching. And so here is Jesus' teaching on relationships in just three words, very easy to remember. So his simple prescription to fix every relationship in your life is simply love your enemies. Love your enemies. And just so you know that I'm not making this stuff up, Jesus actually did say this. We're going to read what Jesus said according to Luke, as Luke writes in chapter 6, starting in verse 27. But to you who are willing to listen, I, Jesus is saying, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will be truly acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. So if you want your relationships to be better, it's simple. Just love your enemies. Simple, right? Well, maybe simple as in not complex. 
but to actually love your enemies is pretty difficult, right? It's not that kind of simple. It's not like simple, like easy to do. It sounds really difficult. I mean, for starters, just love your enemies. It sounds like a paradox. It sounds like it's completely impossible. It sounds like essentially Jesus is saying, love the people that you hate. Well, how do you do that? How do you love the people that you hate? I mean, it seems like a contradiction of terms. You can't love people that you hate. They're, they're opposites. And you can't love people that you hate if, if love is a feeling. But love to Jesus is not a feeling. Love to Christians is not a feeling. To followers of Jesus, love is not an, an emotion. Love is actually a choice. It's a choice that we make. Love does not depend on the other person and how they make you feel. Your love for someone else has nothing to do with them at all. Love is dependent only upon you. It is your choice to love. So if you simply choose love, then your relationships will be filled with love. You will have chosen to fill your own relationships with love. And I know that's easier said than done, right? Love your enemies is simple, but it's a very difficult task. So let's make the task a little bit easier. So today I want to talk about how to love your enemies. Today I want to give you three simple principles to make this very difficult task of loving your enemies a little bit easier. So three ways to apply, these, these three ways, ways apply to any relationship. They apply to romantic relationships, to friendships, to acquaintances, to work relationships, every relationship of every kind. These principles will be applicable and they will help change, transform your uh, relationship. So three ways to choose love when we feel hate. Three ways to choose love when we feel hate. Number one is to pray for your enemies. We just read this in the scripture. This is the first step in shifting those feelings of hate towards feelings of love. To pray for your enemies. To pray for those who hurt you. When you feel hurt by your spouse, you pray for your spouse. When you have a fight with your friend, you, you pray for your friend. And when Jesus says pray for your enemies, he doesn't mean, God, make my wife see that I'm right. God, change my husband from being such a jerk. God, force my friend to see things my way. <laughs> no, that's not what he means by when he says pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies means pray a blessing for them. That's what we read in that scripture. Pray a blessing. Jesus says, bless those who curse you. That means pray for their good. That's what blessing is, is goodness. Pray that you have an opportunity to bless them. That you have an opportunity to do good and kind and nice things to the people that hurt you. And you, you think, you know, this is a really difficult thing to put into practice sometimes because you're like, I don't feel like praying good for this person. I don't feel that way. I don't want to pray for that, that person. Well, again, what does love have to do with feelings? But then also, we don't have to start there. You don't have to start with, uh, with feeling good towards them. You're, you just unload your feelings. What are your feelings? Start praying those to God. Pray your feelings to God. I recently went to this training uh, at for Pearland ISD's Rise Mentoring Program, and the training was about helping kids who are going through some sort of traumatic experience, and how do you help kids that have been through whatever kind of traumatic experience at all, and one of the ways that we can help them through trauma of any kind is simply by getting them to talk about their emotions and listening to them talk about their emotions. Because once they're sort of able to identify their emotions and talk about them, then they're able to move past this feeling of pain and trauma and get to the point of healing. And, and so that's one way that prayer for your enemies can change you in the process. Is God is this one who is listening to us unload our feelings of hatred, our feelings of hurt to him. He's we unload on him and he listens to our emotions and we begin to process them in that moment of prayer. And when you experience conflict in your marriage, you know, one of the best things that you can do with your, with your partner, with your spouse, is to pray for one another. You pray together, which is even better. If you can pray together with someone that you're mad at, that's an awesome way that God can heal that relationship. Now, you don't have to be a good prayer. I know nobody ever feels like they're a good prayer whenever... We're, you know, circled up at a small group or you're around the table about, about to eat food and somebody says, who would like to say the blessing? Everybody looks away, right? Nobody actually wants to pray out loud because everybody feels like they're such a bad prayer. 
There's no such thing as a good prayer. Just stumble upon the word, stumble with whatever words that come out of your mouth. Just fall flat on your face together. It's fine. Just pray together. And it's a, a crazy way that God will use that moment of just realness, honesty between you and your spouse to heal the brokenness that's going on, to heal the hurt in your relationship. I mean, if there's one person in the whole world that we should be able to pray with out loud, shouldn't that person be our spouse? The person that, you know, has pledged, till death do you part? You know, they didn't stand up at the altar and say, I will be with you forever and ever unless you're really terrible at praying. Yeah. So let's just do that together. So your spouse, remember, your spouse is not your enemy. You can pray for your spouse, and you can pray with your spouse. You know, too often in, in heated moments, when we feel uh, hurt, when we fight, and nothing seems to go right in our relationships, we, we start to buy into this lie and believe that our spouse is, in fact, our enemy. That my wife is trying to hurt me. That my husband is my enemy. Now, we wouldn't necessarily say that thing, say that statement out loud. Nobody would admit that. It's not something that's, that's really a, a thought that's conscious to us. It's floating around in our subconscious. It's, it's just back there that we can't articulate. But when times get tough, we secretly believe that our spouse or our good friends have become our enemies. And so we treat them like enemies instead of treating them like the person that, at least at one point in our life, we thought this person was the most important person in our lives and they would never hurt us and never betray us. And, and so we, we don't treat them like the person who pledged till death to us part to us. Instead of treating them like our closest friends when time or, times are difficult, we can start to treat them like an enemy. So we have to remember that first, your spouse is not your enemy. Your good friend is not your enemy. But secondly, even if she were, even if he were your enemy, how does Jesus command us to deal with our enemies? To love them. And how does love for people that you hate start? With praying for your enemy, with prayer. Pray for your enemy. So when your boss treats you like garbage, you know, pray for your boss. Express your emotions to God about your boss and, and pray for your boss's blessing. Pray for their, that they get a raise at work. Pray that they get a promotion. Pray that they... Their kids uh, are, are well. Pray for their wife. Pray for the best blessings for your terrible excuse for a boss. And when your friend hurts your feelings, you, you don't sulk and you don't waste your time kind of projecting, uh, the, assuming the worst about this person. Don't bother with thinking about their ulterior motives or thinking, you know, oh, I bet she did that on purpose. And how could she do that after all I've done for her? No, instead you just start with prayer for that person that hurts you. Express your emotions in prayer to God and then pray for their blessing. Now, the second way to choose love when we feel like hate is to, number two, lend without expecting. Lend without expecting. Lend without expecting to be repaid. See, much of our problems in our relationships stem from our expectations of reciprocity. You know what that means? It's just a fancy way of saying we like to keep score. We like to keep score in our relationships. When we do something nice for someone, we expect, we have expectations that they will do something nice for us. When we act nicely towards someone, we expect that they will act nicely towards us. But that's not actually the way relationships work. Because there's not an official relationship referee keeping a fair score for everybody. And so when you try to keep score, your spouse is also trying to keep their own version of the score. Or your friend is trying to keep his own version of the score. And not only are there not official relationship referees, there's not even a, an official relationship rule book to tell you explicitly what everybody's expectations are and what the rules are of this relationship. And so when we lend expecting something in return, we are going to lose because no one can win at a game with no referees and no rule book. It's impossible. So when you try to keep score, uh, in a game with no rules and referees, you will lose. And of course, you will think that you're winning the whole time because that's the way we keep score, is we think we're the ones that are winning and they're the ones who are losing. We're the ones that are doing all the good. They're the ones that are doing all the bad. But when you keep score in a game that has no rules and no refs, you will always, always lose. You will never be satisfied in your relationship. 
So in stark contrast to our normal rule keeping in relationships, Jesus says this statement, he says, listen, or he says, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Do you know what that basically means? It basically means give them good gifts. Lend without expectation means just give gifts. Just give. Get rid of your expectations of reciprocity. I was just having a conversation with a friend over coffee recently about this very key to marriage. The, the key to a happy marriage uh, is that you give everything and you expect nothing in return. Now, how does that make a happy marriage? Well, you give everything you have to your spouse. You expect nothing from your spouse. And listen, what will happen is your spouse will exceed your expectations every time. Won't she? Won't he? If you give everything and your expectation is that you are to, to give everything and they are to give you nothing, and then they actually give you something, you're blown away. I mean, think of how much more fun it is to not lend loans but to give gifts. It's a lot more fun to receive a gift than it is to be repaid for a loan. Being repaid isn't fun. No one goes to, to return a purchase at the, the <coughs> store and they meet with the customer service representative and the customer service representative credits back the payment back onto your debit card and no one at that point goes, yes, woohoo, thank you so much for your repayment. No, because it's expected. But when someone gives you a gift that you don't expect, well, then you say, wow, Thank you so much for this gift. You didn't have to do that. When you expect nothing, you, they will exceed your expectations every time. Now, obviously, obviously the way marriage is supposed to work, the way any relationship is supposed to work, is that they're not completely one-sided. It's not only one person who's giving everything all the time and one person gives nothing. Both people are giving 100% of themselves to one another all the time. Both people are expecting nothing in return. But the problem is that we can't start <coughs> judging the other person's effort of 100%. We can't say, I'm giving 100%, but you're not giving 100%. Because as soon as we start to judge that effort, we start to keep score. And when you keep score in a game that has no rules, you will lose. So we have to lend without expecting. We have to give good gifts. And the third way to choose love when you feel like hate is, number three, to offer second chances. Offer second chances. Now, in Jesus, one of Jesus' more famous statements, he says in verse 29 that we just read, he says, If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Now, of course, this is not to be taken literally, right? So when some people say, well, do you take the Bible literally? You should say, I take the Bible literally when it's meant to be taken literally and figuratively when it's meant to be taken figuratively, right? So because this is not just about people slapping you in physical violence or actually taking off your shirt or your coat. This is meant to be expanded metaphor. He's not saying, so we should also recognize that he's not saying to uh, women involved in domestic abuse, give your husband a second chance. Move back in and he'll do better next time. Now, that's not what this one statement is not Jesus' entire treatise on domestic violence. Right? This is a bigger picture of all relationships. He's talking about uh, being offended. He's talking about dealing with government oppression, if we read the context of this statement. He's talking about lots of different kinds of relational disagreements. But he's not intending this one short sentence to be a literal, uh, uh, a literal statement on people slapping you, okay? But as a principle for offenses in relationships, as a, as a basic principle, this, this statement teaches us to offer more second chances. That's what it means. So when your friend messes up, you offer a second chance. When your spouse messes up, you offer a second chance. I mean, this is something called forgiveness. Forgiveness. And forgiveness is this free gift that we just talked about giving, free gift of a second chance. Now, of course, how many times? Let's get practical. How many times do we forgive someone? How many chances do we offer? Well, we just keep forgiving. We just keep forgiving. We keep offering second chances, third chances, fourth chances, seventh chances, and 490th chances, to be exact. Jesus explains this to us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, when Peter asked him that question, Lord, how many times? How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus responds, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, 
offer, again, not a literal thing. Not, he didn't say 490 and then the 490 first time you stop offering forgiveness. This is offer so much forgiveness that you lose count. That you just keep forgiving and you just keep forgiving. And this principle right here of forgiveness will actually it will revolutionize your, your marriage, your relationships of every kind. You'll never feel like you've gotten to this point of irreconcilable differences if when you keep having differences, you keep offering reconciliation. That's how that works. Forgiveness will pre prevent you and your relationship from falling apart beyond repair. Your, your friendships cannot fail if you both keep simply offering forgiveness, offering second chances. Marriage can't fail if both spouses keep offering second chances every time the other fails. Forgiveness is the fix to failure in friendships. It's the fix to failure in friendships. And you might say, yeah, but, you know, you can't just keep forgiving, can you? I mean, that's just not practical. That will never work. And, of course, when we read statements like this that Jesus makes, it does not take long for this teaching of Jesus to bring out the yeah, buts in people. And yeah, but I, I just can't forgive him yet. Okay, well, let's start with prayer for your enemy. Pray for him. Then you'll get there. Yeah, but I just can't forgive her for that. Yeah, but when is enough enough? Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but we start. But do you know what this scripture actually teaches about yeah, buts? Your butts have cheeks to turn too. Right? It's okay, you can giggle a little bit. Stop finding more excuses and start finding more second chances. Stop finding more excuses. Start offering more second chances. How many second chances have you had in your own life when you messed up? And aren't you glad that you received that second chance? And not only that, have you ever not been given a second chance? And that really hurt that you weren't given that second chance. How much did that hurt when somebody else didn't give you another opportunity? When you just knew that if you had one more chance, you could make things right. I mean, you can change somebody's entire life by just offering a second chance. And you can change your own life by offering second chances to others. So off, offer second chances. And one more yeah, but is, yeah, but what about me, right? You want me to keep offering more and more second chances to other people. You expect me to lower my own expectations. You want me to pray for my enemies. But what about me? What about what I want? Here's the thing. We're talking about relationships. And relationships don't care what you want. If you only care about what you want, then you're not fit for relationships. You will continually be involved in relationships that fail if you are so concerned with what you want all the time. So if that's you, and if you're only concerned about what you want, then go move to deserted island, be a loner, do whatever you can to get away from people because you you won't ever have a successful relationship if you keep asking that question. Your relationships will be full of brokenness and hurt and disappointment and you will be totally and 100% completely normal. It's normal to think about yourself. It's normal to resist these abnormal teachings of Jesus so much. We resist these principles uh, of Jesus so much that maybe that's why we see so many failed marriages in our Culture. Maybe that's why we see unfriending and ghosting, that those things are a thing now in our culture. Because Jesus is not interested in, in relationships that just keep limping along. He wants us to thrive in our relationships. And maybe if we offered more second chances, and maybe if we lent without expectation, and maybe if we actually prayed for our enemies once in a while, maybe then our relationships would be anything but normal, anything but what we see in our culture all the time. And they would not only survive, but to thrive. That's what Jesus wants for our relationships. He doesn't want our marriages to limp along. He doesn't want us to just be okay in our relationships. He wants the fullness of life in our relationships. And the way he offers us life to the full, the way God offers us life to the full, is by offering us a second chance. Is by praying for us when we were his enemies. That's how it starts. So new life, new relationships. 
They start by Jesus offering the second chance. And today, we all have an opportunity for a second chance. A second chance of life. You know, maybe you've tried life your own way. Now it's time to try it Jesus' way. And maybe we're not just talking about beginning a new relationship with Jesus, but maybe you've been keeping this part of your life separate from Jesus, and you've been doing this part of your life your own way, and now it's time to bring Jesus into it and give Jesus a chance to take that part of your life and to make it new. It doesn't matter what failed relationships you've had in the past. Jesus knows the kind of failure that happens in relationships. He personally knows the pain of failed relationships. I mean, the gospel message, the good news is that the most selfless Savior, Jesus, he was rejected by everyone. So sometimes you're in a failed relationship and you can do nothing about it. And Jesus knows that pain. Even his own friends, his very closest companions, Peter, for example, Peter denied even knowing Jesus when, Jesus, when Peter's life was at stake or when he thought that it might be at stake. So when you are rejected because of your selfishness or the selfishness of someone else, you can still stand with your Savior who was rejected like you, who looked then at his rejectors, though, and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Even in that moment, Jesus was praying for his enemies and praying forgiveness and blessing for them. He is the only relationship that you truly need. So this Valentine's Day time, you don't get bogged down in the romantic part of loving relationships, but know that the only relationship that you truly need, amidst all the broken, messed up relationships that we've all had, the only relationship that really matters the most is your relationship with Jesus. And if you need that relationship with Jesus today, if you want a second chance at life, then I invite you now to just pray with me. So let's just all bow together as we take some time to offer anyone who's here today that would like to say yes to following Jesus, would like a, a real reconciled relationship with Jesus Christ, to just pray this prayer, something like this in the quiet of your heart. Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want to follow you. So today I give you my life. Please fill me with your spirit. I make you my Lord. I receive your salvation. Help me to live a new life. Thank you for this second chance. In Jesus' name.